episode 28, Battle of the Gods, part 2. As the plagues continue, the king of Egypt continues to harden his own heart, even after each of his gods and goddesses are shown up in power by the God of Israel. Yet the magicians would eventually recognize that they were outmatched and try to warn the king, but to no avail. Welcome to the History of the Bible podcast. After the Nile turned to blood, the magicians themselves tried to make water into blood and they succeeded. This caused the king's heart to be hardened because the Egyptian magicians, using magic from their gods, were able to do the same type of sign as the Israelites' god. Therefore, in his mind, the Israelites' god was no more powerful than the Egyptian gods. After the Nile turned to blood, the Lord told Moses to go back to the king and tell him to release the Israelites to go serve their God. But this time, Moses was to tell the king what would happen if he didn't listen. A plague of frogs. Now what can a plague of frogs do? Well, in Exodus 8 verse 3, God says that the frogs will be everywhere in the houses, in the beds, in the servants' houses, in the ovens, and even in the kneading bowls. They will be everywhere. In ancient Egyptian culture, frogs were seen as a symbol of fertility and life. The goddess Hecate had a head of a frog. She was really known for helping women give birth and for helping people to be reborn in the afterlife. Frogs were literally thought to be born from the mud of the Nile. And because Num was thought to be the one that was the creator of life from the mud of the Nile, both Num and Hecate were closely related. Num would create the bodies of the people, and Hecate gave them life. As time went on, she would eventually morph into a goddess that was almost like a divine midwife, helping both women and goddesses to give birth to their children as they were being born. Now, having a bunch of frogs may not seem like a very bad plague, but eventually all the frogs would die. They didn't go back into the Nile where they came from. They just died where they were at. In Exodus 8 verse 14, it says that they gathered all the bodies of the frogs and piled them in heaps. There were so many frogs that died, it caused the land to stink. The symbol of the frogs being a life-giving goddess, Hecate, was now a symbol of death as the bodies of the frogs were piled up just to rot away in the hot Egyptian sun. The magicians were able to replicate the same type of sign with their magic, thus showing the Egyptians that in their mind, their gods were still just as powerful as the Israelites' god. With the chain reaction theory, they say that because the algae and red mud came and killed the fish, the dead fish developed anthrax, a bacteria that would eventually make the frogs sick and drive them from the Nile River to the land. This would create the chain reaction in the plagues. However, the anthrax bacteria can only be found in soil, not water, and it doesn't affect aquatic life at all, and that's including frogs. It only affects mammals, typically herbivores like sheep and cattle. Therefore, it couldn't be that the frogs were running from a disease in the water, because that's not where it develops. This was just the God of Israel showing himself stronger than the Egyptians by calling a supernatural amount of frogs to come up out of the river. Scholars that believe that the plagues are just connected to the creation of the world in Genesis say that the next couple of plagues are all connected to the creation of water, earth, and air. In this plague, the frogs would be related to the water being created by God. As in Genesis 1 verse 20, it says that the water was swarming with creatures. Even though the Egyptian magicians were able to call up frogs, just like the Israelites' God, the king of Egypt came to Moses and Aaron and asked that they would plead to their God to take away the frogs, and then he would let the people go. Moses tells the king that by the next day, all of the frogs will no longer be in the houses, but only in the Nile River. All this will be done as the king asked so that they may know that there was no one other like the God of Israel. The next day the frogs began to die and only the ones left in the Nile remain. The dead frogs were piled up in large heaps just to rot in the desert sun. But after the frogs died out, 
the king hardened his heart and would not send them away as he promised. So the Lord told Moses to have Aaron to stretch out his hand and strike the ground so that it would become gnats. This would be the third plague. The third plague in its attack was on an Egyptian god that was known as Gib, the god of the earth and the physical support of the world, or the fertility of the soil. Because Gib was the god of the earth, he was seen as life-giving, the fertility of the land, but also feared because of the desert that surrounded the Egyptians. Gib was a very important god to the Egyptians. Not only was he the god of the earth, but he was also the father of Osiris and Isis, as this god and goddesses were the first king and queen to sit on the throne of Egypt. So when Aaron struck the ground, he was changing the fertile ground into gnats. Now, some translations may say that it was lice that came up from the ground, but others believe the translation to be associated with the noise that the wings of the bugs make. Some scholars believe the gnat to be a specific kind of gnat that was so small that it could hardly have been seen by the naked eye. However, it has a sting that would cause an irritation of the skin. Because of the sting that causes skin irritation, other scholars believe it to be mosquitoes. But the worship god of the earth that brought the good soil was now where the gnats came from. For those scholars that believe the plague to be connected to the creation of the world, say that it was a plague of lice, which would represent the earth. Just as in Genesis 1, verse 24 and 25, it says that the earth produced creeping things after its kind. However, the word to describe the plague places the bugs as flying ones that would cause skin irritation when they stung. In the chain reaction theory of the plagues, it says that the gnats were mosquitoes and that they just came up from the Nile River. Nothing caused them, except that it was just a natural occurrence. But we know that this wasn't something that just happened. This had the hand of God on it, and that was exactly what the magicians said. The magicians themselves tried to reproduce this plague by causing the dust to turn into gnats or mosquitoes, but they were unable to do so. This is the first time that they recognized the plagues as for what they were, a sign from the one true God. In Exodus 8 verse 19, the magician said, that this is the finger of God. Yet the king would not listen to Moses and Aaron. So the Lord told Moses to rise up early in the morning and meet the king on his way out to the water. Once before him, he was to tell the king to let the Israelites go. But of course the king would not listen. So Moses told him that the next day, large swarms of flies will cover the land of Egypt, all except the land in which the Israelites lived. This would be a sign to the king that the Israelites' God was the one controlling the plagues. So the next day, large swarms of flies were everywhere. The ground would be covered with them. The houses would be filled with them. And today, we go crazy if just one fly is in the house. Imagine not being able to see the ground because of so many flies. The one thing with this plague, besides the large amount of flies, is that God makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. This word for dividing the Israelites from the Egyptians actually means redemption, showing that God is calling out his people to be redeemed and separate themselves from the Egyptians. Only the swarms of flies would affect the Egyptians. This is to show that God has control over the plagues that he is sending, and it was targeting a specific people group to show who was his. Now, the translation of the insect is often thought to mean flies, either an assortment of flies or one in particular, the dog fly. It has other names such as a stable fly, barn fly, and biting house fly. These flies bite down into warm-blooded mammals to suck their blood. Just for the female to lay eggs, it requires for her to be full of blood to lay them. About two to five minutes, the female will suck blood from the mammal and then give birth to her eggs. Usually they are laid in manure. Yes, they do bite and suck human blood as well. But these flies are not known to be in the houses or to cause damage to plants. In Exodus 8 verse 24, it says that the land was ruined by the flies. Often this means that the plants and crops were destroyed by the flies. 
However, these type of flies don't do anything to plants. They don't eat them, nor do they lay eggs on them. So why would they destroy the crops? This is where some scholars believe that it wasn't a fly at all, but a certain type of beetle. This beetle is thought to be an oriental cockroach. These beetles have been found to move in large groups to find cooler areas, often into houses that are cooler than the outside environment. And though they do have wings, they aren't used to fly. These beetles are omnivores, meaning that they eat everything from plants to animals. They can eat any type of material, either soft or hard. Because they are able to eat anything, they have a very painful bite for a human. They destroy clothes, furniture, leather, really anything that would feed these things, they will eat. This would include the crops in the land. Therefore, when Exodus 8 verse 24, it talks about swarms of these insects being in the houses and destroying the land. It would more likely be the oriental cockroach than the dogfly. This type of attack would be against the god Hepri. Hepri was one of the four main versions of the god Ra, the great sun god. And his job was the rising sun. His appearance is that of a beetle, either a beetle itself, a hawk with a beetle's head, or a man with a beetle's head. Then in the afternoon, Ra in his actual form would take over the job of moving the sun. The reason that he, being a sun god and seen as the god of beetles, is because the Egyptians thought that the sun was a giant ball, which it is, except instead of thinking of it as a ball of fire, they connected it to being like a ball of dung. Yep, poop. There's a beetle called the dung beetle, and depending on the species, the beetle will take a bit of the manure and form it into a ball. Once it is formed into a ball, it is rolled away often with the beetle standing on top of it and used either as food or for the female to lay her eggs in. The beetle will then take the ball and bury it underground, where the female will lay her eggs and stay with them until they are ready to go out on their own. This is a god that the ancient Egyptians closely related Hepri, the god of the beetles, with, because they thought it was the beetle that was moving the ball of sun across the morning sky, and this is the god that was attacked during the fourth plague. Being the god of the beetles, the Egyptians were plagued by the beetles. If we were to go off the translation of the insects being flies rather than beetles, this would still be an attack on Hepri. The fly population is controlled by the dung beetles, and if swarms of flies were everywhere in Egypt, it would point out that the dung beetles were not doing their job. Flies need to have manure to lay their eggs in, but with the dung beetles removing up to 80% of the manure, that would leave less places for the flies to lay their eggs in. Thus, it would show the Egyptians that their god of the dung beetle was not doing a good job in removing the manure and not protecting them from the flies. However, with the plague being flies, when God separated the Israelites from the Egyptians in this plague, he was pointing out that the dung beetle god was not doing his job protecting and controlling the fly population. But the god of Israel was able to control the flies and not allow them to go into all the land that the Israelites were living in. Not only was God protecting the Israelites from flies, he was also controlling the fly population. Looking at the plagues from the chain reaction theory, the flies would come from the decaying plants that were just left behind from the Nile River going back to its normal water levels, as well as eating off the dead frogs that were just left from the previous plague. For those that believe it to be connected to creation, Flies were seen as when God created the creatures that filled the air and multiplied. The king of Egypt would then tell Moses and Aaron to go and sacrifice to your God within the land. But that wasn't what Moses asked for. He wanted to leave the land completely to go worship God. So Moses tells the king that it cannot be that they stay and sacrifice, because what they would do would be an abomination to the Egyptians. The reason that the Egyptians would have thought that the Israelites sacrificed to be an abomination is either because they would sacrifice animals that were sacred to the Egyptians, or they would not follow the traditional way of cleanly sacrificing an animal as the Egyptians did. All the animals that the Israelites would have used would have been sacred in one form or another to the Egyptians. However, the main one that would have caused issues is the cow. 
Some scholars believe that it wasn't actually all cows that would have caused the problem, but the sacrifice of a white cow and the red heifer. This would have been seen as an attack from the Israelites against the Egyptians and their religion. This is why Moses didn't want to sacrifice in the land of Egypt, so that he might prevent a riot from happening. Surprisingly, the king agreed to allow Moses and the Israelites to go on their three-day journey to sacrifice to their God, but with the condition that they couldn't go too far, but only if Moses pleaded with his God to get rid of the swarms of insects. Moses would pray to the Lord, but before he does so, he calls the king out for cheating them last time by not letting them go after he said he would. However, once the plague in it, the king hardened his own heart and would not let the people go after all. So again, Moses would be sent by God to go back to the king and tell him to let the Israelites go. This time, the Lord had Moses tell the king that the next plague would come against the livestock of the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. God would set apart the Israelites' livestock so that it wouldn't be harmed in the plague. But for the Egyptians, they didn't have any protection. So join us next time as the battle continues between God and the gods and goddesses of Egypt in episode 29, Battle of the Gods, part 3. Thanks for listening to the History of the Bible podcast. We want to hear from you on how this podcast has impacted you. So please check out the links in the show notes. Until next time, remember that you are loved, special, and worthwhile.